I started, well, we started out in uh, working for Pocket Books, the paperback company, uh, back, in, you know, back in the beginning. Um, and that was sort of in the heyday of, of the paperback uh, era. And you know, we had authors like uh, Harold Robbins, and uh, we had um, you know, sort of the great brands at the time. And it was, a, uh, it, it was an interesting time for, for books, because the industry was transitioning from a um, sort of a t two world system. There was hardcover publishing and there was paperback publishing. And in that era, they began to merge. So a lot of the books that were being published uh, in hardcover were actually being published by paperback publishers. And, paper, and hardcover publishers at the same time were realizing that they had to get into the paperback business in some way. So there was a uh, I would say a confusing but interesting transition going on. Um, with us uh, at Simon & Schuster, uh, people like Bob, Wo Bob Woodward were um, superstar authors. Um, we had Mary Higgins Clark who was succeeding in both paperback and hardcover. Um, uh, we had Jackie Collins who was a superstar at the time. Um, we had, a, you know, we sort of had a legacy. I sort of inherited a legacy of, of Simon and Schuster authors then, that by applying mass market techniques and paperback techniques, we were able to take to new levels. Uh, shortly after I started, I became in charge of the whole, what we call consumer publishing group. So Simon and Schuster and Pocket Books uh, were under one management, and and that's when we were really able to sort of what we called career development. We would, we would start an author out in paperback, build an audience uh, at a point where the paperback audience was large enough. We would then publish the author in hardcover. Um, we were building an, auth an, an audience for the author and at the same time the author was perfecting their writing style and talent. Uh, it was a happy time, it was a good time, and it was a fairly easy time for us. So. You mentioned the whole, I guess, transition, you know, going into paperback books. Now people are starting to do the more electronic yeah. e-books. It's, uh, it's very inter interesting to me, uh, and I could say fortunately or unfortunately, I'm sitting on the sidelines while this transition plays out, uh, but it's my choice to, uh, to let others do it. But what, what I observe is that there are great similarities between how the paperback evolved in the in the 60s and 70s and in, into the 80s and changed the business and how I think the electronic publishing phenomenon of the ebook uh, will do the same uh, in the in the, the years re relatively few years ahead of us so some people are saying that this electronic um, or basically people are saying that these books becoming um, electronic and people doing most of these things online is a bad thing for the the book I publishing can't, industry. I can't I can't imagine how it could be. Uh, if you think about it, the, the electronic book is in some ways a perfect product because it, it eliminates for the publisher most of the negatives of physical publishing. For example, um, there is there are no returns of old, unsold books, so it's not a format where you print the book first and sell it second. It's actually a business where you sell it first and print it second. Uh, it solves the problem of what we call shelf life, where new books have a very short period of time to succeed before they're replaced by the next group of new books. Uh, in, in the electronic world, there, there is no shelf life. The book can exist and will exist uh, forever, uh, as long as there's a demand for it. Uh, in the physical world, you have to produce a book, paper, printing, binding, shipping, warehousing. Uh, you don't have that in, uh, in the electronic uh, space. And, and then, there's a, then there's, there are two other things which are, f I think, phenomenal and, phenomenal and underappreciated. Uh, number one is the, uh, the fact that in the electronic book, uh, with the electronic book, there is no pass along. 
So you can't uh, buy the book and loan it to your friends, give it to your relatives. I mean, so uh, in theory, uh, at least mathematically, if um, you uh, can keep the same number of people reading, so a book that maybe sold 100,000 copies in physical form, um, if the same number of people read it, uh, you should sell more because you, you're not going to be able to borrow it. You're going to have to buy it uh, f for your own consumption. And, and number two is that the uh, electronic book should be a global phenomenon. And traditional publishing is territorial. North America is a territory. Europe, England, France, I mean, languages are barriers. Um, there really are no geographic barriers to, to the distribution of electronic books. And and that's sort of the second thing that's phenomenal is there is instant gratification. You want to buy a book uh, on a Kindle or an iPad or a Nook, uh, you can download it in 60 seconds. You can be reading it in 61 seconds. I mean, there's no you know getting up off a chair, driving to the store, finding the book, paying for it, bringing it home. All of that's gone. So I you know I don't see any downside from a business perspective, as long as the pre present day publishers can manage the transition and stay in control of the creation of the content. So I guess now, are the is the book publishing industry, do you think they almost waited too long to get on this bandwagon with Amazon and Google and you know all these other people now selling these books? Is, is, is the publishing industry now playing catch up? No. The, uh, the important thing to remember is that the content is still owned by the publisher author. It's copyrighted. Um, and, the, and the Kindle or the iPad or the Nook or the Kobo or any of these uh, devices are, are, are simply distribution vehicles. They, they, don't, they don't own the content. They are virtually little bookstores that you can carry around in your, in your, uh, your briefcase. Um, they haven't taken possession of the content. That's not to say they won't try or, or that, that it won't evolve that way, but I think in the present day paradigm, as long as there are physical books and they're still the dom, you know, let's not forget, physical books are still the dominant format. Most people still read print uh, and ink books. Uh, the publisher should be in control of the content uh, for the foreseeable future. And something else I wanted to uh, ask you about is a lot of, it seems like a lot of publishers are now um, creating conservative imprints separately from, I guess, their major lines. Why, why is that? I, the simple answer is I think they finally figured out that conservatives buy books. Um, probably a better answer is that, uh, at least from my own experience at Simon & Schuster, it, it probably wouldn't surprise the audience to know that most publishing people are liberal. Uh, certainly the publishers and the editors uh, are, are liberal and um, people tend to publish what they like and what I found at, at Simon & Schuster was what we we had a sense that there was a huge conservative audience out there wanting to buy books but nobody wanted to publish them for them so we basically found the one conservative publisher I had in the place and she started an imprint called Threshold Editions and uh, some of the, the best, the biggest successes that, that companies enjoy in the last few years have come in that, in that category. And also, uh, what, were your some, what were some of your favorite authors while you were at Simon & Schuster? Um, they, they were, uh, many of them were authors that not only did I read, but I, but I became friends with, um, most notably an author like named Vince Flynn, who's a now a number one best-selling author, or an author named Brad Thor. Um, these are people who, when I was actually actively publishing, uh, I participated in developing them, sort of discovering them, and really enjoyed the, the fruits of their success. So that, you know, personally, they're among my favorites. Uh, one of my all-time favorites is Lee Iacocca who I did a book with actually at Bantam Books that set records and is probably the book I'm most closely associated with and Lee and I became good friends over the years and uh, happily about four years ago I did another book with him 
uh, and he was then in his probably mid 80s, which became a bestseller. So it was it was kind of rewarding. Uh, I was always fond of Mario Puzo, who who still has written my most favorite book, The Godfather. He was a great character. And um, lastly, I guess kind of to to bring this all around, where do you see the future? Where do you see book publishing going in the next 10, well, 15 years? I think it's going to go rapidly to, to an electronic uh, driven business. And by that I mean, uh, I think not, not too far down the road that the electronic book will be uh, what I would call the reader's edition. I mean, it's clear to me now that people will read uh, electronically, uh, in, enjoy it, have gotten over the, the uh, concerns about physical books. Um, so, so in terms of what I said earlier, the convenience uh, of the delivery system, the pricing, um, people have already shown us that uh, electronic books uh, will and are uh, important. So I think a smart publisher has to look down the road and say, well, if my main audience is electronic, then maybe I should release the electronic edition as the, pr as the primary edition and follow it up with what I, what I would call the furniture edition because the, the physical books are still uh, you know, uh, adored, uh, cherished by readers and saved. Uh, I mean, it's, there are millions of miles of bookshelves in America that you're going to have to fill uh, with something. And so I think that there will be plenty of opportunity to sell physical books, but I don't think physical books will be the dominant format um, five to ten years from now. I think electronic books will. And so I think that today's publisher has a challenge to figure out how to manage in the old world of paper and ink and transition their company into the new world of digital publishing, knowing that both are going to be important. But what I see, and certainly I don't, I'm not intimate with it anymore, but I don't see publishers looking at electronic books as individual f formats that need to be published uh, separately. I see most publishers uh, happily letting the ebook tag along on the efforts that they uh, put forth for the physical books. I think that's a mistake. Um, I, that will be recognized and, and corrected. Uh, but it's difficult because you've got people who are trying to preserve one world and s thrive in a new world. It's not the easiest um, challenge in the world. And I, and I also think, and I think this is important, that relatively quickly, original ebook publishing will evolve and so that there will be books that will be only published electronically uh, and then if they succeed in an electronic edition might then be published in a physical edition uh, or might not. Uh, so I think a lot more books will be published as a result of the electronic book uh, phenomenon uh, but different books. Are ebooks as lucrative as printed books? They should be more lucrative. Um, it depends upon how the publishers account and how much overhead they charge to the electronic edition. But um, in, the, in the electronic format, <clears throat> you have no manufacturing costs. Uh, you have no um, uh, selling or distribution costs. You do have some selling costs. So you basically have the creative cost of creating the content. You have marketing costs. And then you have the author's participation, the royalty payments. Um, it, it, I can't imagine that they're going to be uh, hugely more profitable. They should be.